So, so we go on now with Maya Indira Ganesh from Tactical Tech. If you have been to the Republica, you have seen her a couple of times, I think, or one time at least. And she's now talking about big data bodies, machines and algorithms in the world. A huge applause, please. Vielen Dank für deine Einladung. And that's the only thing I can say in German. I'm really sorry, but um, uh, my German is not good enough to give this whole presentation. And um, uh, so I'm going to have to stick to English. So um, I'm going to just start with, in the next 20 minutes, telling you about a single issue publication that I've been working on at Tactical Tech. It's called Seen Through Machines, Data Discrimination and Design. This publication will come out um, in a few weeks, I hope, um, and has a number of essays in them. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about a couple of these essays, uh, some contributions um, in the publication. Um, I want to start with something that happened to me recently. I got into a little bit of miscommunication with my landlord. He sent me an email that said this, and it ended up in my spam folder. And as a result, he was a little bit annoyed that I was sending the rent to the wrong account for many months. Now, spam filters are the most common and familiar kinds of machine learning that we come across, but they still get it wrong. This email looked a lot like a phishing attempt, so it got sent to spam. So, which is great. I mean, it made me feel very secure, but also annoying. It was also annoying because I missed this email. Machine learning at its most sort of base level in a very simplified way is a process of computer software reading a lot of data and identifying patterns and associations in that data, like how different pieces of information in that data set are related to each other. Um, and we can move on to something a little bit more complex that relates to the, the sort of topic of my talk. Now let's see if this works, because I have a link embedded in this. And I hope there's sound. No. I'm just going to stop it for a moment and see if I can. OK, the sound in this machine. Um, nothing is happening. OK, maybe we won't do the video, which is a shame. Um, but anyway, this is a video by, um, it's on YouTube, as you can see. So Dr. Michał Kuczynski is a computational psychologist at Stanford University who develops deep neural networks, a kind of machine learning process that is said to closely mimic how animal brains are thought to work. They are used to identify patterns in faces based on images loaded online. Let's see if we can hear him. No, 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 let's check it. Okay. Okay, let's pick up. Shall I try again? <coughs> it was just working when we tried before. We fixed the laptop. Aha, okay, of course. <laughs> Ich weiß es nicht, ob ich weiß nicht, ob es ist. Er sieht, er sieht ihn nicht mehr. Keine Ahnung. Okay, it doesn't matter. I don't know. Sorry. Can you fix it in the next break? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We'll just go with this. So, um, so what Dr. Kuczynski does is that he uses um, uh, deep neural nets to identify. Uh, extroverts and introverts. And in the clip, he was talking about how um, you know you can look at people's faces and identify their gender, uh, how you can look at people's faces and identify their political views. And um, and he was saying that um, you know we get outraged when we think that machines can do these things. But if you think about it for a moment, we do these things all the time. We're constantly making these decisions about people based on when we see their faces. So why can't we train machines to do the same thing? So in that clip, he was showing extroverted people and introverted people p their faces and uh, asking us in the audience, uh, his audience in that talk, to identify which one was the extrovert and which one was the introvert. 
uh, people got it right, machines also started getting it right because they could identify patterns in the way that extroverts and introverts were taking photographs of themselves. These were all selfies. Um, so, so, th so that's what the talk was about. Um, and how machine learning works is that the software called algorithms are exposed to a training data set. In this case, faces of people. And the data can be really anything, but it looks at patterns uh, within those sets. So what Kuczynski was looking at with the extrovert-introvert was tilt of the head, separation between the eyes, shape of the nose, breadth of the forehead. Um, and then the algorithm was picking up those, um, those patterns in the faces and being able to identify them uh, in new faces, so in a new data set that it had never seen. And this process of kind of like looking at faces and identifying things about people is, is nothing new. I mean, we know that this is like over 150 years old um, in trying to identify criminals, for example. It was a big thing in Europe about 100 years ago. Um, now, what's interesting about Kuczynski is that a few months ago, he was in Berlin, and he gave a talk where he described this research. He also talked about new research where he was applying facial recognition technology um, to gay and straight faces. He was um, working with the data set, he said, of self-identified gay and straight people who had posted their pictures online, as we all do, and using algorithms to read these faces and to be able to identify patterns in them, whatever patterns they saw. And then um, he said that with 90% accuracy, his algorithms then, based on what they had learned about the patterns in those faces, and we're talking about like 20, 30, 35,000 images, um, that uh, they, the same algorithm could look at a new data set and identify uh, what was a gay face and what was a straight face. Um, and so he talked about this research. It's not published yet. Um, he was just uh, you know, sort of talking about it, so I can't actually give you a citation. Um, and then the next slide he showed us was about, uh, uh, was a map of all the places in the world where homosexuality is criminalized and in some places punished by death. And he said, wouldn't it be really unfortunate if um, this kind of technology was available to uh, you know, kind of governments in these places. Um, and he, I think he was concerned, but uh, that did not make him sort of think about the technology he was developing. Anyway, um, it's also useful to note that Dr. Kaczynski's uh, research on psychographics has been in the news for the, l for the last few months because it allegedly Cambridge Analytica used his research to um, do micro-targeting for election campaigns. So there's kind of interesting connections there. So let's move on to another example. There's an anecdote about border crossings between Canada and the US. This is from some time ago. The porosity of the border has made it possible for citizens of one country to travel, live in, and work in the other. So it was common for border control police to randomly ask people crossing to say the last four letters of the English language alphabet, because it isn't always easy in that part of the world to identify people based on just how they look or how they speak. Canadians following the British English pronunciation would say WXYZ, whereas Americans would say WXYZ. This quaint technique was of course very quickly learned and hacked, and of course after 9-11 passport checks became mandatory. A version of this continues over in Europe. In a recent news story, Deutsche Welle reported that the German government was considering bringing in voice recognition technology to distinguish Syrian Arabic speakers from Arabic speakers from other countries to ensure that only citizens fleeing Syria were receiving asylum in Germany. Deutsche Welle reports that such software is based on voice authentication technology used by banks and insurance companies. However, the news um, report says that, uh, quotes linguistics experts who say that such analyses are fraught Identifying the region of origin for anyone based on their speech is an extremely complex task, one that requires a linguist rather than automated software. In 2012, the artist Lawrence Abu Hamdan held a meeting in Utrecht in the Netherlands to talk about the use of speech recognition technologies in asylum cases of Somali refugees. Having ascertained that they were coming from relatively safe pockets of Somalia, the Dutch authorities wanted to deny them asylum. Working with a group of cultural practitioners and artists and activists and Somali asylum seekers, Abu Hamdan was able to show that accent is not a passport and was in fact a non-geographic map. Abu Hamdan writes that the maps explore the hybrid nature of accent, 
complicating its relation to one's place of birth by also considering the social conditions and cultural exchange of those living such it itinerant lives. It reads the way people speak about the volatile history and geography of Somalia over the last 40 years as a product of continual migration and crisis. Voice, eventually, is an inappropriate way to fix people in space. So as Nicole Shepard writes, we must look at the practices of quantification and what they mean, but as a sort of continuation of history. Big data are the latest trend in a long tradition of quantification with roots in modernity's fetishization of taxonomy in the service of institutional order. And what's interesting about sort of looking, or at least interesting for me, in looking at big data technologies is um, in a way that sort of challenges the assumption of that um, all of these algorithms and machine learning and big data just kind of plug very seamlessly into human systems and we can speed up and automate things. Uh, and as Shepard says, we need to look at the sort of historical continuities, especially where gender, race, and sexuality are concerned. So I'm interested in data and discrimination, in the things that have come to make us uniquely who we are, how we look, where we are from, our personal and demographic identities, what languages we speak, these things are effectively incomprehensible to machines. What is generally celebrated as human diversity and experienced is transformed by machine reading into something absurd, something that marks us as different. Big data technologies are not only being used to classify, but also misclassify us by what we say and do online. There's a very interesting recent uh, Pulitzer Prize winning investigation by ProPublica, maybe many of you have seen this, that showed that racial bias was being perpetuated by the use of algorithms that predicted recidivism rates or the rates, the likelihood of offending again, uh, in that it was predicting that people of color were more likely to commit crimes in the future than white people. What I found interesting about this story was that it exposed the ways in which state and private institutions, social prejudices, and multiple databases collude in the creation of algorithmic mechanisms with bias. Such networked effects have become the stuff of everyday news now, each story presenting a fresh outrage to establish notions of human rights and dignity. For example, image recognition software that runs on machine learning identifies black people as gorillas or Asian people as blinking, Latanya Sweeney finds that people with black-sounding names were more likely to be served ads for services related to arrest and law enforcement. Interestingly, I was in Canada recently, just at the, the beginning of August for a few weeks uh, for a summer school, and I found that as soon as I went to Canada, I was getting these ads for arrest and, uh, you know, take care of your criminal record and bail, and it was kind of shocking to me and I thought that oh, okay maybe in Canada people with Indian sounding names have you know uh, seem criminal. Um, so this sort of line of questioning um, that interests me in looking at data and discrimination is a continuation of tactical tech's work um, from an exhibition we did last year called Nervous Systems Quantified Life and the Social Question which we did at the House de Culture and Develt in um, between March and May last year what, qu what nervous systems did was to try and tell a more layered, layered and nuanced story beyond just how algorithms work, but to look at the complex infrastructures of quantification and software, but also culture, symbols, values, and practices. One of the things that nervous systems did was to sort of unpack the historical precedent to big data, lest we think that these are, thi these are things that are new. And I like this quote by Shannon Mattern that, you know, this quantifying spirit is something that's, that's kind of old in, in Europe, but also in many other parts of the world. Um, explorers were returning from distant lands with new bites of information, logs, maps, specimens, while back home Europeans turned natural history into a leisure pursuit. Hobbyists combed the fields for flowers to press and butterflies to pin. Scientists and philosophers sought rational modes of description, classification, analysis, in other words, systematicity. Okay, I pronounced that right. So I want to sort of go from this ordering and systematicity to the idea of discrimination itself. And um, so I start by sort of unpacking what does the word discrimination mean? And I want to, um, and actually, you can move away from discrimination in a legal sense to sort of think that where, what the examples I've been talking about 
show that discrimination is about being very clearly identified, being very clearly distinguished and seen. It's not necessarily just about disadvantage per se, but about visibility. And what does visibility through a machine mean for different kinds of people? In work that I did last year at Tactical Tech with Jeff Deutsch and Jennifer Schulte, we wrote about what we call the tension between anonymity and visibility. We examined the technology practices and environments of LGBT activists in Kenya and of housing and land rights activists in South Africa. We found that they wanted the kinds of visibility that technology brought, but in order to do their activism and make their claims, that visibility brought risks because of their marginal position in society. Being gay and from a working class background or a very Christian environment or from a small town or some combination of these was, um, uh, w was much more risky perhaps for someone who was maybe English speaking, upper class, urban. Both ran the risk of exposure through technology and had to maintain their presence online very carefully, but the latter's visibility was less of a liability. So for the past four months, I've been working on the zine or magazine about data and discrimination, which I call Seen Through Machines, to sort of examine what it means to be seen through machines, but also what it can we look through the machine in the process of doing so. Um, these are some of the, the, the contributions that are there, and I'm going to take you quickly through them. Uh, the first one is actually really interesting because Luisa Prado is a designer who's looking at this artifact called the Humboldt Cup. It's actually on display at the Me Collector's Room um, uh, in Augustraße in Mitte. Uh, the Humboldt Cup is a 17th century Dutch artifact. And what she does is she traces this cup which has engravings of Brazilian natives um, and, um, and through that explores how racial classification and the census in Brazil developed. And since I'm running out of time, I'm going to leave that and talk about the last D, actually, which is design. So there's data discrimination and design. And I've been really interested in sort of struggling with the idea of design and what we expect of design in this context. If we design something better, we think maybe the problem will go away. Or that if, if we have more visibility and transparency in the design process, it will be improved, systems will be improved and held to account. One contribution in the scene, zine that talks directly to this is Kate Sims' contribution on anti-rape technologies. She says that anti-rape technologies are about good user experience, UX, as well as about gathering more data about the context in which rapes happen in order to design more b better systems. She finds that the design process is dislocated and anti-rape technology is actually developed in many different cities. And, is it a, and because this process is dislocated, makes accountability difficult. Amy Elliott and Cade Deem directly take on UX design and the weaponization of design and malware, saying that just making something easier to use, even if it's malware, doesn't, isn't necessarily a good thing. There's a lot of emphasis on marketing good design to make systems more usable. Caroline Sinders writes to designers and technical experts to consider that perhaps machines and machine learning are as messy as the people who make them. In showing how complex it is for machines to learn how language works, she discusses developments in automating online harassment and abuse identification in Wikipedia. At some level, talking about machines and bodies and data and discrimination is really also a study in failure and, uh, and error in machine systems, but also in our own human imagination and empathy for and about each other. So I will end on that note um, and ask that you uh, w look out for our new publication. It should be out by the end of September. Stay in touch, and I'm happy to take more questions as we go forward. Thanks.